I see Jose Canseco on film, and I don't think it's me. And when I watch Jose Canseco play, I'm thinking, who is that guy? It wasn't me, it was some other individual using a chemical. And that seems like 100 years ago. At one point in time, now I'm the highest paid baseball player in the world and the best baseball player in the world. All of a sudden, you're worth nothing. Steroids and the use of steroids has destroyed my life completely. Everything I accomplished and did as a professional athlete is nullified. I guess I was just accustomed to it. I was just used to it. It was, it was a part of me. And I guess if I have an addiction, I guess that's how they work. I started realizing, why am I using steroids? Why do I need steroids? I don't have to be an elite athlete anymore. I think right now it's the proper time for change. I was the fastest player in the game. I was 6'4", 250 pounds, chiseled. It's the best in the world. I could do anything. I had it all, definitely. Nine miles from the nearest major league stadium sits Ralph Clark Regional Park home to the Fullerton Slow Pitch Co-Ed Softball League. Two guys, we got Rick, we got Heidi, Ronnie, Jose, Jordan. Batting cleanup on this Sunday morning is an unemployed left fielder named Jose Canseco. It's been seven years since Canseco last played in a major league game, and two decades since he was considered the greatest player on the planet. I was an entertainer. I was completely different looking at everyone else. Look at those arms. He knows it's gone. I actually try to take the baseball to its limit. There's a high drive, and there she goes! I would want to see how far a baseball can possibly travel. I took it to its limits quite a few times. Whoa. And it settles into the upper deck. Oh, my goodness. He was the 1986 Rookie of the Year, the 1988 MVP, the first player ever to hit 40 home runs and steal 40 bases in a single season. Canseco's physique was like none other in baseball, and his performance followed suit. But behind the historic accomplishments lay a dark secret. Canseco had been using steroids since he was a struggling minor leaguer looking for an edge. We're talking about well over 20 years ago. No one knew really that much about steroids. It was more of a word of mouth type deal. Oh, whatever my, my buddy told me, you know, he was big and strong. So I figured if I use it, I can get big and strong. The timing was perfect. I had nothing else to lose and everything to gain. It was a perfect opportunity to make a pact with the devil. And I guess if you want to call steroids the devil, I, I made the agreement. A bulked-up Canseco grew into one of the most talked-about prospects in baseball. After a dominant run in the minors, he was called up to the Oakland A's and soon became one of baseball's most prolific sluggers. A game that had always considered bodybuilding taboo had a new breed of superstar. Basically, I'm changing the face of baseball because of what I did and the way I looked. When I first started using steroids, there, it wasn't against Major League rules, regulations. That's why when other players came up to me and asked me, I'd be more than willing to help them, to educate them, because I wanted them to do well and prosper too. In all, Conseco played for seven teams in his 16-year career and claims to have educated disciples at each stop. 
remember injecting Mark McGuire, Rafael Palmero, Juan Gonzalez, Ivan Rodriguez, all these individuals. I was telling the whole baseball world that asked me, Jose, how do you do this? Well, I'll tell you, I used this substance, that substance, and then I did this workout program and ate these foods. That's why I was known as the godfather of steroids, because not only did I bring it in, I educated the players, but it overwhelmed Major League Baseball. As baseball bulked up, so did home run totals and ticket sales. All-stars became superstars, and superstars became living legends. History was being rewritten at an alarming pace. Eyebrows were raised, and Canseco found himself out of work. They knew that I was godfather of steroids. What they did was get rid of me, to send an indirect message to the rest of the players, meaning, if you continue using steroids, we're gonna get rid of you just like we got rid of Jose Canseco. Eventually, I tried to play uh, for minimum salary. It was a no-go. I said, I'll play for free. And they said, no way. We can't use you, we can't touch you. All organizations said this. And I was very angry at Major League Baseball. Very angry for what they did. And I wanted, I'll be honest, I want a revenge. Canseco's revenge was the 2005 number one bestseller, Juiced, in which he detailed his own steroid use and outed several former teammates as well. The backlash was immediate. It was an outright attack on me. I was going against the world. Um, people were calling me a liar, a snitch. But then as time went on, they started realizing that the book was 100% accurate. Other players started getting caught. Players who testified before Congress, like Rafael Romero, I've never used steroids. I have never used steroids, period. A month later, he tests positive for steroids. Every player I've challenged, every player I've made a statement about, every single statement, not one of these players has contradicted it or has sued me. That tells you a lot. Canseco remains a pariah in baseball circles. For now, Slow pitch softball is his most competitive outlet. But competition isn't the only reason he's on the field. Heidi Northcott is Canseco's live in girlfriend. The recent stress of maintaining their rocky relationship has taken a toll. Joining the league was Heidi's idea. I think um, lately it's been like the glue that holds it all together, you know, because we can get on the field and set aside our differences. It's hard for Jose to express himself. So it just, you know, it just gives us another way to relate, I think, which is good. But the athletic outlet has not been enough. And Heidi recently offered Jose a choice, steroids or her. After 25 years of use, Canseco quit, but the process has not been easy. I don't know, you know, what that does to your mental or emotional state um, when you stop doing something you've done for 20 years straight. But it's been difficult trying to be happy when I've been around somebody who's been constantly depressed, angry, bitter, you name it. I feel like it's getting time for me to, you know, maybe move on, but I don't know what Jose would do without me. He definitely has more at stake here than he even realizes. Maybe it will change some things chemically in me. Maybe I won't be as quiet sometimes, or sometimes I get very depressed. And I, I kind of like go in my room and, and just hide. I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. I'm at the point where I want to completely sever from steroids, sure. but I think I'm going about it the wrong way. He thinks it's okay for professional athletes to use performance-enhancing drugs. He was mentally and physically dependent on anabolic steroids. Well, I'm here, this is my home, and I can't get in because my house has been foreclosed on, and they've changed the locks.
How are you doing, Dr. Jose? I'm yeah. Michael. Nice to meet you. Teacher. Please have a seat. Sure. Any seat? Yeah. How are you doing today? Good. Pretty good. So, Jose, is this the first time you've been to a physician? Um, for this subject matter, yes. I think my main concern is I want to completely get off steroids. I am going through depression now, so forth. And I think my testosterone level are extremely low. I have no sex drive whatsoever. I mean, zero. I, I don't know what to do. I feel like, should I go back on it? Should I, you know, come to you and ask you? I, I really want to know what my body looks like and the damage, if any at all, sure. that have happened for the last 20 some odd years. I'm at the point where I want to completely sever from steroids and stop using steroids. Sure. But I think I'm going about it the wrong way because I don't think cold turkey's helping me. Well, go ahead and give me a synopsis of what you've used. Um, well, let me give a little background. Uh, okay. I've been using steroids since I was 19 years old. And the types, they range anywhere from your basic testosterone, your cypionates, your sustenons. I've used, I've used growth hormone. I've used equipoise. I've used decadurabolin. I've used Winstraw. And while you were on these, were you monitored? No. At all? Okay. Listen to your lungs. Good. He thinks it's okay for professional athletes to use performance enhancing drugs and that those aren't drugs. What he means by that and what he's suggesting is that because they don't have an immediate effect on the brain, then it's not a drug. Well, testosterone does have many effects on the brain. Depression, fatigue, and all of the different complaints that he was stating. I think he was mentally and physically dependent on anabolic steroids. I'm amazed that he's even doing this because this is not his character. It's not his character to say, hold on a second, let me think about my future. Maybe I should stop. That's not Jose. Well, we've done all the um, testing and I guess we're gonna find out what the results say. And then when we come back, we're gonna have a game plan. Then hopefully come out with something that will change my life for more, for, in, a, in a more positive way. This is a big change. And maybe a big change means hope. He's been through a lot physically, mentally, financially. Maybe steroids has been at the root of a lot of this. Canseco's legal and financial woes date back to his early days of steroid-fueled stardom. Baseball's bad boy has been busted once again. Among the litany of infractions were two domestic violence arrests and a 2001 nightclub brawl that landed him behind bars. I think the perception about me out there is aggressive, which I'm not even close. Obviously, I had, you know, domestic violence issues with my ex-wife. But they weren't really having to do with aggression. One was, uh, by accident, two cars collided in my first marriage. And they called that domestic violence. That was a pure accident. Second was, OK, I pulled my wife's hair. But it was more for, hey, stop talking about my dad, trying to get her attention to stop. And boom, again, domestic violence. And then said that happened at a bar brawl four or five years ago in Miami. People don't really know what really happened. I took polygraphs and passed them completely. The DA down there would not allow him. I spent four months in jail because of that. It was horrible. I, I think a lot of times these individuals look at me as a target that can be collected on financially. I mean, I'd be anywhere, walking the streets, walking to a restaurant, at a bar, at a club, and you would hear people say, snitch, you know, wife beater. Even guys would try to confront me, to fight me. And Sometimes I look at them and I say, do you realize what I can do to you? <laughs> do you have any idea? But I never engage them at all. I can see how the public views him. You know, he looks kind of angry. He's always serious. He's always quiet. He's had a lot of issues over the past two years, and it just seems to have recently just piled mountain high. He's basically got no money because he owes in the millions right now. Canseco was once the highest paid player in baseball, amassing a total career income of over $43 million. But after two divorces and a series of lawsuits, liens, and poor investments, he's nearly broke. I don't own anything. I rent everything. I rent my cars, I rent my home, and I try to pay as much upfront as possible. I'll do miscellaneous things, now and then card shows, appearances, and so forth. Um, 
sometimes some reality TV shows, but I don't know exactly where my next page is going to come from. With his fortune dwindling, Canseco bought this multi-million dollar home in Encino, California in 2005, putting a million dollars down and spending 600,000 more in renovations. But when he stopped making payments this spring, foreclosure proceedings began. Canseco was evicted, and though the house remained in his name, creditors had changed the locks. Well, I'm here, this is my home. I've got my personal belongings inside. Uh, I've got some clothing, some furniture, a lot of patio furniture out back. And I can't get in because my house has been foreclosed on and I don't have the keys. They've, they've changed the locks. I remember being here when I put up these lamp posts, all this concrete was poured. The whole property was expanded. I was here, it took eight months to actually construct this whole backyard. I guess this was part of the dream. This was part of being a major league baseball player. But, you know, times have changed. Obviously I'm not making anywhere near the same money and, uh, and it's all come to an end. Well, this is my kitchen. I mean, my lights, my glasses are even in there. Some electronics are in there. Um, a vacuum that I left in there, a whole bunch of stuff. And here, this is the formal living room. And I've got chairs in there. I've got chess sets in there. I've got, in, in the bar area, I've got glasses. Uh, chandeliers are still here. Some furniture. We, we put this floor in, we put those stairs in, we put that upper floor in, we put those chandeliers in, and it's all gone now. Nothing I can do about it. Today we're going to go over the results from the testing from the other day. I was always scared and intimidated and never thought I belonged. Sometimes people actually will scream out names and call him a snitch. I know that if he could turn back time, he would not have written that book. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Jose, good to see you. see you. Good. Today we're going to go over the results from the testing um, from the other day, and I'd like to explain that to you as well. Okay. Your total testosterone was 110. Uh, normal reference range is between 350 and 950. Whoa. And that's a pretty wide range there. So we also check your free testosterone, and you were still low there at 2.6 normal between five and 40. Wow. But tell me more about um, your mood since coming off the depression. steroids. Okay. Uh, a lot, so. Right, a lot of quiet times, depression, want to be left alone, no sex drive whatsoever. I mean, like. So zero. now can you see how um, testosterone would be considered a drug? Yeah, especially if you're coming off of it. <laughs> it's, sure. it's a chemical that works in the body in a certain way or the body needs that chemical. Not only that, you I also see have that he's Tired, doesn't have the will to do anything, to that. not training, right. everything's aching. So it's mm -hmm. almost like the same kind of withdrawal symptoms that somebody who's using what he considers a drug, like, you know, yes. in order to feel good, in order to function, they need it.
I used steroids for such a long time, 20 some odd years, and my body forgot how to make testosterone. It's that simple. And I thought with time, it would come back, but it hasn't. I think that your, with your testosterone being so low and with the symptoms that you're describing, that you're having, the testosterone replacement would be appropriate here, not by needle, but by gel form. Don't expect the same, if you Muscle will. Muscle building effects? The same effects after you did an injection of testosterone. This is gonna be much more subtle. It's gonna help you out. It's gonna replace testosterone. It's important to let you know that this is medically necessary and it's much more different than, different than what you're used to performance enhancing wise. The prescription gel is not a performance enhancing steroid. It's a low dosage supplement designed to retrain Conseco's body into making its own testosterone. Overcoming a 25 year addiction is a daunting challenge, but for Conseco, grappling with internal strife has been a lifelong struggle. I just remember being very quiet, extremely shy, real skinny. Each week in social studies, we would have to pick a subject matter and present a report before the class. I could never do that. I, I would just take the, the flunking grade because not in a million years could I go up in front of a class and say two or three words, which is impossible. My first year in high school was JV. My second year was JV. My senior year, when all the other great players were gone, there was no place to put me but to put me in varsity. And then I had pretty good, you know, 455 with 10 home runs. But nowhere near what I developed into, this power hitting, you know, destroyer. There's a drive deep to center field, maybe, and Sheridan takes a look, and it's in the upper deck. But I was always scared and intimidated and never thought I belonged. I think that made me even more shy and more quiet to the point where people didn't understand me and they thought I was arrogant because I couldn't talk to them. He's been outcast by baseball and baseball defines him. And I think he acts like maybe how a young boy would act that was kicked out of the only thing they loved. Sometimes people actually will scream out names and call him a snitch and even try to start fights with him. It hurts him tremendously. I know that if he could turn back time, he would not have written that book. I wish people saw the human side of me, the normal person that I really am, a friend, uh, a family member, a father. He's just the most amazing guy. He's so loving and caring and gentle. He thinks for me first before he thinks for himself. I am actually very proud of my dad. He is a great dad. He's like, and he couldn't treat me any better than he does. He's like the best dad. 11-year-old <laughs> Josie Canseco is Jose's only child. She lives with her mother, Jose's second wife, Jessica, and sees her father two weekends a month. It's amazing that that's my child. She's very smart, very sweet. And um, all I can do as a dad is just be there for her and see how she's growing, getting old. She's 11 years old now and developing. I'm like, wow. I can remember when I held her as a baby. It was just amazing. Jose's devotion to his daughter has proven problematic in his current relationship. Live-in girlfriend Heidi has a daughter of her own seven-year-old Danica. Jose doesn't really do much in the role of father figure for her, which is unfortunate and makes me sad. And his excuse is that he has a daughter and because he doesn't see her as much as he should, he can't have a relationship with my daughter. I should be holding my daughter and giving time to my daughter and the guilt is so bad because I ruined a relationship. And that's the reason why I can't be with my daughter. So now I'm working on another relationship with another child that I have to now be the father of that child. It, it's so difficult to even hold the child without, without the guilt getting even stronger and stronger. It's, it's like a repellent that kind of destroys me inside and I just know how to deal with it. I really don't. I used to keep my distance from Josie, his daughter. But I realized that uh, a problem with Jose is not a problem with his daughter. It probably 
makes her feel that like, you know, why am I doing this? If, if Jose is not gonna be nice to my daughter, then this is ridiculous. Why am I doing this for his daughter? I've put in a lot of effort just overall, not just with his daughter, but with his life. And I feel like having a relationship with an innocent seven-year-old, beautiful little girl who's so easy to get along with, I just feel like it's so small to ask when you care about somebody. It's gotten me to the point now where I feel like, like I have to move on, you know, like it's just not gonna happen. But I also am very careful about, you know, backing out at this time because when I care about people, I'm there for them. So I kind of feel like I need to be there now. Heidi and I, uh, we split up. You know, her attitude is um, its overwhelming. It's, it's just too much. I came back and the place was totally empty. I don't even have a bed to sleep in. I've never been back since I was black from the game eight years ago. Scary. My name's Bob. How you doing, Bob? Good. I'm a registered processor with the County of Los Angeles. OK. And I'm actually here to deliver a little back to the It's moving day once again for Jose Canseco. Citing incompatible personalities and a need to face his problems on his own, he's now settling into his third residence in the last five months. Well, I've moved out of the whole house almost completely now. Heidi and I, uh, we split up. I don't know if it's gonna be temporary or not. There's some issues there um, that I have with her and her strong attitude and character. There's a lot of things that happen that, you know, people don't see, uh, you know, personal things. And, you know, Heidi's a great person. I, I love Heidi. She's a great girl. She's got a lot of things going for her, but she likes to control everything and do everything. You know, her attitude is, um, it's overwhelming. It's, it's just too much. He had Saturday and Sunday to move out, and I came back, and the place was totally empty. I don't even have a bed to sleep in, so. She knew exactly when I was moving out. And she knew exactly what was going to be taken out of the house. And for sure, I thought, well, Heidi being an individual who likes to have everything under control, who likes to take care of everything, would have furniture ready to be moved in. It didn't happen. I'm not so confident about whether or not we'll make it back to being a strong couple again. Um, there would have to be some major changes, um, some revelations in, I think, both of our lives. Um, in order to see that happen. One day I want to be with her, I want to marry her, the next day I, I can't. And I definitely either need to let Heidi go completely or we need to just tie the knot and get married. And both are, are equally scary. But commitment is not Conseco's only fear. Coping with addiction, impending bankruptcy, and domestic turmoil is hard enough but returning to a place where he was once beloved and now largely despised is even scarier. Hey fans, good evening and welcome to the 50th season of baseball here at Historic Blair Field. I dream sometimes that I'm playing or that I'm trying to play and then the bus leaves me behind or that I'm locked out of a stadium. I just don't even know how I got here. It happens so fast. It's incredible. Canseco's big league retirement didn't spell the end of his playing career. In 2006, he served a brief stint with the semi-pro Long Beach Armada, but left before his contract was fulfilled. The league has been trying to serve Canseco legal papers for nearly two years. He has never attended a game as a fan, and after reaching out to several teams, it was apparent he's not welcome in a major league stadium. Long Beach's Blair Field is one of his last remaining options. I've never been back 
since I was blackballed from the game eight years ago. Not once. Scary. I guess because of the memories. I guess because I don't know how the public or the fans are going to react to me. And whether I'm going to be accepted or not, I have no idea. It's like you're walking into a, a dark alley. When I was on the field, the field protected me from the fans. Now not only can I not play, which I'm but now I've got to face the crowd, the fans, right in the belly of the nightmare. But Canseco's worst fears were quickly put to rest. What's your name? Heaven. Heaven? Nice to meet you, Heaven. Is your brother? In some circles, he may still be a pariah, but on this night, he was simply a former great, accommodating a steady stream of admirers. Is it okay if they get a picture with you? Sure. It's all right? Well, I watched you come to Boston with the A's and play against the Sox in 88 at ALCS. That was a long time ago. Hey, one sit over here. You were great. Thank you, appreciate it. You a hard time, and you were great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. All right, appreciate guys. it. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. All right, All right guys, you. take care. Have a good night. But by the fourth inning, a pleasant night took a turn for the worse. After league officials caught wind that Conseco was in attendance, a county official was summoned and Jose's decision not to fulfill his Armada contract finally caught up with him. Hey, hey, how are you? How are you? Good, how are you doing? My name's Bob. You know Bob. Good, I'm a registered processor with the County of Los Angeles. Okay. I'm actually here to deliver a little document to you. Okay. Okay, so we're trying to make it as easy as uh, possible. So this is it. Okay. This is going to be the case name right up here. Mm-hmm. And it's self-explanatory. It'll tell you what it's regarding. Okay. Just to make you aware, there are some uh, legal obligations here, like 30 days to answer the written uh, like that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank All right. Yes. Yeah. Sure, I can. Here you go. Thank you. Good night. I didn't know what to expect. I was very nervous walking through the stands. And people were very positive and very supportive. I didn't get any any anyone being rude and I thought the night was gonna end up perfect then. You know, I got served this, uh, a lawsuit. I couldn't believe it. I mean, the organization that this team sued me and so much I've done for them. I mean, I've donated money to them and about $10,000 for the clubhouse. Um, played here, sold out their stadium. And now they served me with this, with this lawsuit that's just, I mean, it's just incredible. I, I, it seems like I can do no, no, no right. I come here and I end up with a lawsuit in my hand, which is incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm in shock. Your testosterone level was only minimally elevated to 146. Now normal would be anywhere between 250 and 800. 250 and 800, I'm only at 140 mm -hmm. something? Wow. I made a lot of mistakes in baseball. Obviously using steroids, bringing steroids into the game. But I think the biggest mistake I made was I should have not written that book. Well, I'm here at the doctor's office to get my levels checked again, 
to see how well the andro gel that prescribed to me has worked. It's been, I don't know, three, four weeks. You know, hopefully the levels show that I am normal or who knows, it may be lower levels and we may have to take another angle. First, I'd like to know how you're feeling, how you felt when we started the medicine compared to how you were when you weren't taking it. Overall, I feel better. Um, I think I've lost a little bit of weight, but I, I, I don't think it's really, maybe four or five pounds, that's probably normal. What about the depression you were having before replacement therapy? It's gotten better. I don't really notice the big waves, the big dips, the big ups and downs. So it's a little more constant, meaning I'm not as depressed. Overall, a whole lot better. Okay. What I wanted to go over were the exact numbers. Before we started therapy, your testosterone level was at 110. And being on the therapy for over a month, it's now, it's only minimally elevated to 146. Now normal would be anywhere between 250 and 800. 250 and 800, I'm only at 140 mm -hmm. something? Wow, so I'm way, way short so far. You've been taking it every day? Every day. And would you say you've missed any doses? I may have missed uh, a day here and there, but then the next day I'll double up. Okay. So overall, it's, yeah, four pumps per day. Is it a possibility that my testosterone levels may stay low forever or I'll need medication forever or, uh, you know, testosterone therapy forever? Is there a possibility? It, it's very much a possibility because for so long you were bringing in testosterone from outside of your body, putting it in and shutting down your own body's testosterone production okay. and so and then years later now we're finally um, monitoring it and finding out what those levels are and they're very low we haven't really reached the desired goal that we wish to have then I think we should send you to an endocrinologist and he can go over alternative um, ways of treatment different medicines and um, be able to monitor you more appropriately and more specifically, I think. All right, thanks a lot, appreciate it. You're welcome, Jose. Good luck Thank with you. everything. Thank you, appreciate okay. it. Okay, bye-bye. I know that I've got to give this time. I know I have to be patient. I know I've got to see experts. I know I need help from them to educate me and to show me how to do this. I don't expect my levels to come back right away, and we don't really know even if my levels will come back at all to, to normal. And we still don't know exactly what's going to develop in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I think taking accountability, I think getting off steroids, a lot of times opens up your eyes to other things and other doors and other channels. And, you know, admitting, making mistakes, some things that you do wrong, apologizing. I made a lot of mistakes in baseball. Obviously using steroids, bringing steroids into the game. But I think the biggest mistake I made was I should have not written that book. And the more I think about it, you know, the more I regret mentioning these players in my book. Because, um, you know, I admired them, I, I respected them. But at the point in time, I was so mad at Major League Baseball, so disappointed at them, and I felt like I was alone. And I felt like I needed to put them in my book as evidence to show the world that I was telling the truth. I never really realized this was gonna blow up as big as it was gonna blow up and hurt so many people. They were my friends, teammates. You know, you kind of have a bond and if I could uh, meet with Mark McGuire and these players, I definitely would apologize to them because I think it was you know, the more I think about it, the more wrong I was. I wonder sometimes if I can go back as an 18-year-old kid, 19-year-old kid, and I never used steroids, what I could have accomplished. And would I be in this position I am right now? But by the time you realize, what am I doing, it's too late. And you just continue to do it till something blows up and definitely everything blew up for me. I made mistakes. 
I know that I'm trying to correct them. I'm willing to work at it. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to become a better person. I know now that I don't need steroids. I can get off steroids and, and live my life. I know that it's scary living with Heidi and without her. I did so many things wrong, but I truly believe I've got more than most. And I try to put myself in other people's shoes that have less than I do. And I think if they can do it, I, I can do it also. All my life been told no, no, no. And all my life I've beaten all the odds. All I have to do is beat the odds one more time. This is probably the worst time in my life. And I think I can beat it. I can go from here and become a better individual. But I gotta fight. <laughs>